I'm John Curran. I'm the president and CEO of Aaron. Um, I have uh, been with Aaron since its inception as the founder, one of the founders um, and uh, served as chairman. I'm presently uh, president and CEO, but I've also in the past run, built and run a couple of networks. Um, I actually come to Nanog to meet with old people, uh, employees who used to work with me. Quite a few are in the room right now. Um, so what I want to talk about is IPv4 address transfers in the Aaron region. Reason to talk about this is it's easier for you to hear it once from me than try to hear it third hand, second hand, third hand, or fourth hand from other people. It's also true that this is complicated to some extent. It is not trivial. And so um, I'm here to explain it so you can say, yes, I heard John say it, and I went and looked up the reference materials, rather than having to take a guess at what you might read in a blog somewhere. Um, so first thing, do we have IPv4 space available? As Jeff uh, so eloquently said, yes, we do in the Aaron region still. Um, we publish an inventory online each and every day. So if you go to the inventory, you go to www.aaron.net, look in the lower right-hand corner, you will see as of this morning we have 4.95 equivalents of slash 8 available. And that goes down routinely. I've never seen it go up. It goes down. Um, ETA to depletion, early 2012, somewhere between December, maybe January, very hard to predict. Um, I would have said the end of the first quarter, but we're seeing a remarkable uptake. One um, interesting side effect of telling people that we're running out is they seem to realize they should get it while they can. We've had a remarkable uptick in requests for address space. Um, in, on February 3rd, right after the Miami Nanog meeting, there was an event, and that event actually had an impact to how Aaron uh, processes certain types of requests. So IPv4 requests, this is coming to Aaron looking for address space. Prior to February, prior to the IANA free pool run out, you could request 12 months of your address space need. Whatever your need was based on your past utilization, we would issue you 12 months of additional space. Once the runout occurred, the second paragraph kicked in, which means you can now request up to three months of address space. So we do have address space, but we're giving it out in quarter cups instead of cups, or you know, 250 milliliters as opposed to a liter. But whatever you want, you get a smaller slice now, and you have to come back more often. This is a pain, in case you're curious. This means we're effectively processing more requests to give out the same amount of space. We're not a big fan of it either, but it's to make sure that everyone has some sort of an equitable landing, that we're all requesting space and running out approximately in an even basis. Now, this doesn't affect transfers. You actually can find someone else who has address space, and if they can make it available to you, and you can persuade them to give it to you, you can have us transfer up to 12 months from them to you. So you can only get three months from Aaron, but we will process transfers for up to 12 months worth of your need, just as you used to be able to request. Um, so let's talk about that. Specified transfer policy. All the policies in the Aaron region are developed in an open mailing list and an open public policy development process. You don't have to be a member of Aaron. Anyone can participate. We have this mailing list called PPML that gets a few messages every day, and you get to participate, and it's fun. You get to participate in the meetings, either remotely or on site. Well, one of the policies that the community developed is the specified transfer policy. And it allows parties to recognize that they may want to transfer addresses from one to another because they have addresses they don't need. Maybe they're using them inefficiently. Maybe they got a huge allocation in the earliest days of the internet. Someone else needs them, that's great. It improves the overall efficiency of the system to get those addresses back into play, get them back into use with an organization that does. So the policy provides to transfer to a qualified recipient. And a qualified recipient, someone who comes to Aaron and says, I have need, just as, just as you used to request address space, you now request address space, only we qualify you to receive it. Um, it's not a market. We don't actually match parties. And in fact, even the service that we have, I'll talk about on the next slide, Aaron's here to process the requests. We're not involved in party A and party, party B, other than to make sure that party A is the actual registered holder and that party B is actually qualified to receive it. Um, now, people say, well, I want to make sure that transfer, when I finally show up to update the registry, I want to make sure it goes smoothly. How, do I, how can I do that? Two ways. 
First, as a recipient, you can come to Aaron and say, hey, I'm requesting 12 months worth of address space, please pre-qualify me. We will process your application, we'll ask for your allocation history, we'll look at your SWIPs or look at your online updates to Aaron Online, and we'll qualify you to receive a certain size block. That's how a recipient gets pre-qualified. Um, how about for a seller, if you're selling a dress space? Well, okay, so the way you do that is you have it under a registry agreement, either an RSA or a legacy registry agreement. If you've registered, then we've vetted you and we've made sure that you are the registered holder, and that means you meet the requirements for transferring it. So if you want to be certain, as long as you've met the prerequisites, uh, the transfer should go through very smoothly. Now, some people say, I don't want to engage with Aaron, I don't want to do this, fine. You can still process a transfer, but recognize if we find out the person trying to sell you address space was never the registered holder, well, it's not going to go through, obviously. That's the, why a registry exists. We're not part of the compensation, by the way. Um, you know, they give you address space, you give them money. Um, you give them chocolate chip cookies. We don't, we don't want a chocolate chip cookie. We don't want the money. Okay, we do charge an administrative fee for processing the transfer. But the reality is that it's between those two parties. Okay, why do we have this policy? We have this policy, again, because the community, and you are this community, decided that you wanted to allow transfers. If we didn't have this, we wouldn't be able to recognize that there was a need for address space that some people were going to fulfill but not update the registry. This allows us to have more accurate registry information. In fact, of the uh, 10 most recent transfers that have occurred, I know four or five of them were for one dollar. An organization that used to be affiliated with another had let another organization use their address space and now it's five years later and they're separate companies and they forgot to update the records and for one dollar they can take that slice and transfer it to them. As long as the recipient's using it, they're definitely qualified. So we already see that the transfer policy is making for more accurate records. I think that's a good thing. Okay. Specified transfer listing service. This is not the transfer policy. This is an optional service. And we had suggestions from the community to do this, so we're putting it in. And what it is is if you have address space you can make available, or you have a need for address space and you want to be contacted by people who have it, it's a listing service that lets parties find contact information for each other. In fact, if you're just an organization that wants to help parties find each other, you're facilitating buyers and sellers, you can also participate, okay? So those needing address space, those who have address space available, and those who want to play facil facil facilitator or moderator or matchmaker. So why won't you want to get involved? Well, if you need a, if you have address space and you're making it available, you can use the STLS to see whether or not someone's potentially interested. If you um, have address space, you can get people to call you by listing it as available for sale in the listing service. Um, there's even a business model in just matching buyers and sellers. Again, not Aaron's job, but if you want to be matchmaker, you can do it and participate in this. Um, there's going to be a lot of people doing this. Right now in the Aaron region, we don't have a lot of demand because you can still get address space, but I am very confident once we no longer have address space in the region, you're going to see a lot more address space transferring hands. So that's the listing service. And it's, uh, again, optional. You don't have to do this. You can come to Aaron. You can meet at the beer and gear, find each other, come to Aaron, and we'll just update the registry. But if you want to be contacted or you want to make it known you're looking for address space, this is a way to put your contact information out there. Okay. so. That's a very quick summary, isn't that great? I may actually be able to catch us all up on schedule. Um, a couple of things. First, more information about Aaron and IPv6, Aaron, Aaron, www.aaron.net. Um, getting involved in Aaron. The reason you want to get involved in Aaron, I don't want to harp on this, but these uh, policies affect your life. And they're adopted by a bunch of people, developed, and um, if you don't participate, that doesn't affect whether they affect your life. See, the policies are developed in an open process, and whether you participate or not, Aaron has to operate according to them. How often are there policies that affect the NANO community? Well, at any given moment, we're working on a handful of them. Right now, if you go out to the Aaron help desk that's out there, there's a handout 
policy proposals under discussion. This has 12 policy proposals that are currently under discussion that affect how address space is managed in this region. By the way, this is an abbreviated list because more have been submitted since last week when these were printed. So I literally have to tell you, you can get involved or not, but it's going to affect your life. Now, um, that's it for my, my presentation. I tried to leave a lot of time because I do actually expect questions. Uh, if you want particular information on the transfers or the listing service, these are the URL. Uh, but I'm going to open it up to questions of which we never have a shortage. I'm going to be proven wrong for the first time. Yes. Sandy Murphy, Sparta. Uh, the CIDR working group has asked the RIRs to uh, assist the working group's work in discussing how the transfer policies would be reflected in our PKI and certificates. We had an RPKI tutorial here uh, on Sunday and a talk tomorrow, so this is of interest to this community as well. So we have a confluence here of IETF and Aaron and uh, NANOG interest. That's actually a very good point. Um, I guess the most important thing people need to realize is that what we're doing with our PKI will, and how we decide to handle transfers, as much as you think about a registry as being a fairly simple list of of address blocks and, and registries, it's actually a very complicated inverted tree of address space and of registries, both linked to one another. When you do a transfer, there's four or five different ways you can decide to reflect that in the RPKI tree. So um, I do know that there's uh, been a lot of interest, and I'm hoping that the RIRs will get together and document how they want propose to handle transfers in RPKI because that will affect what type of transfers. Uh, ultimately, that could constrain transfer policy based on the technology that's used and the particular constraints. So that's, again, another reason to try to get involved here. Okay. Thank you. I hope that we will see an answer on the CIDR mailing list about yes. this as well. Yes. Thank you. I know there is interest to get one. No other questions? You guys are all address transfer wizards? Nah. Back microphone. Sam Weiler, also from Sparta. Leaving aside the RPKI issues, are inter-RIR transfers working? Oh, inter-RIR transfers are right now something that's being discussed in nearly every region. Mm -hmm. um, we have some challenges. You actually have to agree on a philosophy for how to handle inter-RIR transfers. <coughs> and to do that, you're either going to do that as a global policy that requires a five-way match, or a pairwise coordinated policy. Um, we've had success at neither. Um, now, the RIR system is, in some ways, um, a remarkable success, because if we can't agree on something, we don't do it. And so that's our present status. We can't agree on it, so we're not doing it. There's a meeting in two weeks' time, maybe one week' time, I'd have to ask someone, in Singapore, of uh, ICANN. And I know that uh, both the ICANN board and the ICANN Government Advisory um, Council, the GAC, have asked the RIRs to talk a little bit about our progress handling things like inter-RIR transfers. So we'd really like to get some functional policies here. Um, we'll all be talking to our respective communities like you folks to say, let's see if we can achieve workable policies. The reason it's so important, by the way, is not necessarily because um, we have to have a working inter-RIR transfer policy because operators need it to survive. A lot of operators have realized they're going to be moving more towards V6. World IP V6 Day has helped a lot. Um, and uh, But it is true that Without globally coordinated policies here, we're going to see a lot of strange attempts and the last thing we want to transfer address space. And the last thing we want is inaccuracy in the database. So, yes, microphones are still open. Uh, quick question. So uh, the uh, APNIC is making their list of transfers uh, publicly 
visible on the website. Is uh, Aaron planning on doing that? Is, does it already exist? Um, it doesn't exist right now. We're actually working on that. It took us a while to catch up with just getting IPv6 issues in our daily feed of updates. We actually got that accomplished last month. Uh, we're going to work on getting the results of transfers put into the same daily feed. So you can do an RSS to keep track of that. Um, probably going to take a little while to make that happen because we'd like to do it automated. The question is whether we bother to record transfers manually. I've been sending updates to PPML. I'll probably be doing that until the automation's complete. Okay. I'm going to give you nine. Oops. Here we go. Questions. Uh, Daryl Smith, TW Telecom. I was wondering if this transfer policy applies to pre Aaron space. Sure. Let me talk about that because that's actually probably the coolest question. It was going to come up. I just didn't know how it was going to be asked. So I'll make it very simple. Um, Aaron's philosophy on this is that there is an Aaron database that has registrations. Um, all the registrations in the database are subject to Aaron's policies. That includes those that were in existence from the earliest days, uh, from DOD, from SRI, from NSI, when NSI transferred it to Aaron. Um, we are the registry for the region, and our policies apply to all the registrations, both legacy and non-legacy. Recently, there's been some interesting um, developments, I guess. We had a, a court case, we had a couple of court cases, actually, but we've had some visible ones. Um, Aaron actually interceded uh, in one matter. Uh, we got the court to acknowledge that parties had interests, right, or not interests, rights, certain rights in the, their registrations, and that those rights might be transferred in accordance with our policies. So we recognize the database has lots of records in it, and those records we administer on behalf of the community. Some people are the registrant. They have the right to be the registrant. They have the right to update. But you guys have rights as well. You have the rights of visibility. You have the right to see the records. And those rights are actually um, mediated effectively by the public policies. If we have a policy that says there shall be an administrative contact, then everyone has to put an administrative contact in, regardless of whether it was a legacy registration or a current registration. If we have a policy that affects the visibility of who is, it's the same way. The database is run according to the policies developed by the entire community, and they apply to all the registrations in the region. So, okay, any more questions? I hate to give you seven minutes of, of extra time to eat cookies. Um, last chance, the microphones. Thank you for having me. <laughs>